when we look at our industry and when you look around the room, we know that amazing things are happening. We know that there are so many more questions that are yet to be answered. But the people in this room spend their days asking, what if? What if we could use tobacco to fight Ebola? What if we could make a pacemaker that's smaller than a vitamin pill? What if that didn't work? What if we could create a totally artificial human heart to bridge that patient to transplant? Those are just a few of the questions that are being answered right here in Arizona today. Now, for us to continue to grow, for pioneers like Dr. Curtis to continue to do the work that he does, and for some of the companies and many more like them that you will meet tonight, to succeed, we have to not just transform the way we look at health, but also fuel that growth with investment. Whether that investment is at the state level, at the federal level, or at the private level. Because as my good friend Mara Aspinall says, patients are waiting for us. <laughs> Equally important, we're going to be going to the polls in November. And we cannot do this alone. Whether we're looking at the federal level for our representatives that are going to represent us in Congress or at the state level, it is absolutely critical that not only do you vote, but they know you vote. That you send an email to the person that you voted for, and I don't care who it is, but you tell them you voted for them. So that they know and tell them that you are a member of Arizona's life science community because we have some huge opportunities ahead of us. The Board of Regents and through the Board of Regents, our three universities have committed to doubling our extramural research in this state from $1.1 billion per year to $2.2 billion per year by 2020. That's big. Now I'll tell you something else. There is not a leader anywhere who will expect their team to double their performance without the resources to get the job done. Which means that we have to figure out how to get the universities a billion dollars in research infrastructure funding so they can do 1.1 billion more per year in perpetuity. Now, I don't know about you, but as an investor, those numbers make sense. Quite frankly, I would like to see some of my other investments have that rate of return. As we continue to grow, we have to move, and you've heard me say it again and again and again. We have to move from discovery that is happening at our universities and the discovery that is happening in our companies, and the discovery that's happening at the federal level, to development. We need to take what we're learning, and we need to apply it. You're going to hear Charlie's story. And Charlie had a once-in-a-lifetime experience of a drug that had never been tested in patients, saving patients' lives. But it doesn't normally work that way. As a matter of fact, our clinical trials process is designed so that we can safely treat patients as we are developing it. You'll see on the ballot very soon Proposition 303. Proposition 303 is the right to try. It says that patients 
have the ability to try a drug that has not been approved by the FDA outside of the FDA process. There will be a lot of questions about that once it passes, and it will pass. Because as we all know, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And from a federal perspective, just because you can try doesn't mean we're able to help you. So as an industry, we are a voice. And it's not my voice. It's our voice. And our voice and our minds and our hearts are transforming health. We are asking the question, what if? But more importantly, we are finding the answers to those questions. And the more that we work together, the more that we collaborate, the more that we grow and approach critical mass, the more you will see patients' lives changing because you and you and you committed to make a difference.